Our next speaker uh, brings together climate sciences and narrative arts through the power of storytelling. Jeff Biggers is uh, a member of this year awards uh, jury and is also part of the network since 2021 with his project Climate Narrative Project. The project aimed to train a new generation of storytellers that is able to collaborate with sciences, local organizations and administrations to create new climate narratives that galvanize action. So uh, in his monologues that he will be presenting today, he incorporates regenerative urban planning to tell the story of uh, an extraordinary city that uh, became an axis for climate resilient actions. So now, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us today. If we are going to speak about climate change in Firenze, we begin with Leonardo da Vinci. Because da Vinci warned us 500 years ago. He stood on the banks of the Arno in 1503 in view of what he called il Ponte Nuovo. This was the bridge after Ponto Vecchio. And he determined that Firenze needed to understand the issue of flooding if the city intended to sustain itself, let alone diminish its rival in Pisa. And there, Leonardo pointed at the Arno. Do you see it? He said, there's the Storione, the Keppia, l'Anguilla, la Scazzone, il Lucio. He said, there's the Pike and the, the Gobi and the European Roach. In all the work of da Vinci and other Renaissance artists, you began to see how many native fish were in the Arno. But the truth is, we did not listen to da Vinci. Even after the great floods of his period, even after the great flood of 1577, even after the great flood of 1740, the great flood of 1966, and then the annual great floods of 2023, 2024, 2025, these floods that always followed historic periods of drought for years in Italy. But it wasn't a great flood. But the great works of art from the Renaissance that finally made us realize we had to have an understanding of the past, that we had to have an understanding of the Arno, that we need an understanding of Tuscany in Italia as our prologue if we're going to begin to have any kind of planning for climate and the climate crisis in the future. In 2023, there was only one native fish left in the Arno. And that is La Tinca Tinca. You might know it from the risotto sulla Tinca. But we changed that. And what we're going to talk about today is how we restored the Arno and restored Firenze in a role of our lives. Now, the people here invited me to come and speak about what we did in our quartiere. Here in Firenze, we created the Quartiere delle Cascine. And we became the first carbon neutral neighborhood in all of Italy. But of course, that is not entirely accurate. As you all know, the city of Siena became the first carbon neutral city in all of Europe in the year 2011. But what we're going to talk about is this bridge, this bridge that goes from Siena, this bridge that goes all the way back to where we are in our decades. The real question is, not our accomplishments today. The question is, why did it take us so long to catch up with Siena? You know, it seems almost absurd. We had the climate crisis in our headlines. We had reams of studies. We had these endless announcements of tipping points. And even the scientists had declared we had reached a point of no return. And you have to wonder, why is it that we relied on foreign natural gas in Italy and its methane catastrophe even when we knew we were walking into this disaster, even when we knew Siena and the rest of Tuscany had all the alternatives. Of course, Siena is surrounded by these CO2 absorbing forests and the answer, of course, came from something even older. They had been there for centuries, all the way back to Dante, who referred to it as the Valley of the Diavolo. 
he talked about the Valle Fiede. And of course, he was referring to geothermal. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the discovery and the first use of electricity from geothermal happened here in Tuscany, in Lardarello, in 1913. In 1913, they lit up the lights from geothermal. In the rooms of Lardarello, throughout the whole region. And it was an invention that was arguably as important as anything that Marconi or even Edison would create, but an invention that ultimately got shuffled into the back. This is why we have to go back to history. This is why we have to understand that our green cities, our eco-cities, our sustainable cities, our smart cities, our intelligent cities, our regenerative cities, the resilient cities, la città ideale, as we said in the Renaissance, all have the same meaning. But they don't have the fortitude to go forward. This is really what we wanted to show you with our quartiere. That it's not that we need new ideas, and this expo is full of fabulous new ideas, fabulous, absolute technology. What we need is the fortitude to be able to make a decision and to go through. And an amazing uh, slide we weren't able to put in was Botticelli's Fortitude, his first grace masterpiece of the Renaissance of a young woman in armor, ready to go up to the task to change is one of the great virtues. So the question is not, do we look at Dante's Inferno or Dante's utopian idea of Paradiso? It's how did we reimagine our city as a regenerative city, doing something not just less bad, but actually enhancing rather than harming our environments? This, of course, seems logical. Like today, for example, I came down this morning on the hydrogen train from Bologna. And of course, there was no CO2 emissions. And from there, I actually went to Santa Maria Novella, where there are new kinetic panels that are in the train station. And these kinetic panels, of course, generate the electricity that power the station there. And then I jumped on the tram to come over here to the Fortezza. And these are kind of things that we take for granted now. And perhaps that is where we'll begin, is our story is with water. Still today, 45% of the Italian communities are at risk of flooding. And yet, we're facing one of the worst droughts in our country's history. We still had this inability to react and actually take advantage of what we call the new term for rain, precipitation whiplash. And we still do not harvest 90% of our rainfall in Italy. But this was back in 2023. And this was when we began to make the changes. You see, it started to rain in Firenze one day. It started to rain and rain. It began to come in centimeters, and then it went in inches, and then it went in feet, and then it went into meters. And at the certain point, we realized we had not followed what we had been promised that we had only one reservoir, the Bilancino Reservoir, that had been completed out of the 23 we needed. And we found out there were two things for sure. That a crisis is never a crisis until it's validated by disaster. And that adapting to a failed system is not adaptation, it's failure. So our city flooded again. And this is what happened to Firenze during our next great flood. And you all know this. You've become almost insensitive to these images, as we know, the, the screens of disasters that no longer really affect us. And instead, in my neighborhood, just beyond the Parco della Cascina, our electricity was gone, our power was gone, we had no way to preserve our food. And so we began to do the one thing you do in Italy, in the midst of a crisis. We set a table and we began to eat and drink and to tell stories. We set the table 
and our neighbors began to come out after the flood. And the table began to grow down the neighborhood, and it wound through all other parts of the quartiere. And then it went all the way around to other parts of the city until we had four kilometers of tables set with people and their food after the flood wanting to begin the discussion. How do we come together to finally change our city in a way that can deal with climate change? Finally, someone rang a bell. I think his name was Ayman Sharif. He was a composition professor from the Conservatorio. And he was from Bangladesh, now teaching in Firenze. And he climbed onto the table and he said, we need to do something different. How can we risk losing all the great art of Firenze again? But how can we risk now losing our vineyards to historic drought? How can we begin to lose what we have created here in Italy? Perhaps we can go beyond just some sort of climate resistance. Perhaps we go beyond sustainability. Perhaps we begin to embrace the idea that we can do and create a regenerative city, a city that not only consumes, but replenishes all the resources that it needs. So instead of waiting for the government, instead of waiting for a government to collapse or waiting for a government to operate on Twitter, instead of wondering when is the city administration going to do something, we went back to the original reason of why we created Florenza. Why did we create this city? And this is where I'm in, this professor from Bangladesh who said, don't you understand, it's not rocket science, it's easy, I've come from Bangladesh. So many of the immigrants who have come here from Italy have gone through this experience of dealing with flooding and fires and drought. That maybe migration can be a resource to understand how we become resilient and how you reclaim your history. He said you need to go back to the Agropolis. You see, Firenze was founded as an Agropolis. It was a circular town with a circular economy on the river. The houses were adjoined by urban farms. And there was these, the cascina of ducks and dairy. And we were encircled by these three-tiered diversified farms and livestock and surrounded by CO2-draining woods. You know, this is why we actually created the cities throughout all of Italy. They were self-sufficient especially in the period of the Renaissance in search of la città ideale. But something happened. Of course, technology began to have breakthroughs. We began to have horse and buggies, and nobody has a problem with that. But then we began to create a different type of city. Thomas Edison, of course, and the first coal and oil barons and the gas barons in the United States and Europe began to question the Agropolis and began to realize that you can't have decentralized sources of energy like solar or wind that Tesla wanted, but you needed to have centralized sources to make money. And so they began to put aside geothermal. They began to build their cities based on petroleum, and they called it a petropolis. You had the rise of Henry Ford. You had the rise of Fiat and Torino. You had the rise of cities that went around with petroleum in mind. And Firenze changed. It became a different place. The circle of Firenze was gone. The road became linear. We brought in our energy, and then we spewed out our waste. We brought in our food and our goods, and then we spewed out the waste into landfills. For every bag of groceries, we created six bags of plastic. We used pesticides to increase production, and chemicals poured into our rivers. And we simply could not get out of our cars. And I'm in back at that table. During the flood, ask us in our quartiere, I mean, where does your electricity come from? And what is the real price to the land and the people and the climate? And where does your water come from that you drink? And what is the price of your waste? And where does your food come from? And the big question is, why at the supermarket do 
do you buy pomodori from Holland if you live in Italy? The truth is we lost the circular metabolism of the city like we did in all of our cities in the country. And it wasn't a complexity, of course. It's just that the promises of transitioning to renewable energy was too late. It was like saying, I, I recycle my wine bottles. I, I bike on the weekends. I buy my wine from Chianti. But that was not enough. So we began to shift in a new way, not to go back into a utopia, not to pretend that we can go back in time, but to go into the future, that from the Petropolis, now we create the Ecopolis. And we said, why not look at what other cities have done? For example, why can't we be a laboratory as we were in the Renaissance? Look at the city of Freiburg in the Vauban district, which is very similar to our quartiere here near the Parque di Cascine. The buildings there were transitioned and completely operate on 100% renewable energy. And we said, why can't we do the same with geothermal and solar and wind in Tuscany? Why aren't we able to institute energy efficiency campaigns and renew and train new workers to actually reshape and refit and retrofit our homes? How do we begin to create a new economy within our region? as Vauban market did it. And within Freiburg, within three years, 80%, 80% of the people gave up their cars voluntarily because they no longer needed them to get to work, to get to the market, to get to the theater or restaurant, or to get to a trail. We realized first, of course, that in order to have the Acopolis in Firenze, we had to stabilize our water crisis. We had to create waterproof areas as they've done in other parts of the world. With underground reservoirs and cisterns and pumps, we had to turn the park into a laboratory of action with gardens and ponds dissolved, designed to absorb water. In the process, the enhancement of our water system allowed us to create urban farms. Because the soil now is fortified and it provided an ability to raise food. We looked at our history and we said, if the Parco de la Cascina is called the Parco de la Cascina, then why aren't we doing what it was founded to be, which was to raise food, to raise livestock? Why aren't we able to take a riverside that was created centuries ago and do the same that in London, thanks to hydroponics, they actually are using light advances and growing organic vegetables in the underground bomb shelters, and they deliver them directly to the restaurants above. Why can't we do something on our riverbanks? So in the outskirts of our neighborhoods, we set aside blocks that we then turned in that had once been part of golf courses and industrial areas, and we made them community gardens. Everyone had a right to a plot. Everyone was in a searched and everyone was provided a community garden. My neighbor Angelica told me once that if you took three meters by three meters, you would be able to get all the nutrients you need for your family through an organic farm. And my other neighbor, Malik, showed me his row of veggies in a hoop house with carrots and peas and beans and bell peppers and potatoes and cabbage, and he called it the Sambusa Virontina. But this was our real issue. In the year of the great crisis, we had to set food benchmarks. We said, why are we importing 52% of our food in Tuscany from the world? And within three years, we were able to change that to less than 15%. Across the parco, we turned everything we could into a green zone that we could begin to cultivate. And of course, we knew that local urban farming would not solve all the food needs of our region. We talked about a place called Adelaide, Australia. Back in 2003, it was a city of 1.2 million people completely dependent on coal electricity that having, was having a crisis with its river, that had no way of dealing with its waste, and it was actually having a crisis of transport. And so the city of Adelaide invited a thinker in resident to come and sit down with the town leaders. 
a scientist. They invited someone like Da Vinci to change the way they live. And after nine weeks of meeting and brainstorming, they came up with the concept of the regenerative city. They began to go quartiere by quartiere. They picked the first zone and shifted it and immediately made it into 100% solar and wind generated. They began a campaign to reforest the whole city, tearing up asphalt and planting three million trees. They created a diverse semi-urban farm around the city as a food network to meet local demands. And they announced that they would have zero waste. 180,000 tons of compost were converted annually into urban organic waste and then brought to the farms that encircled the city. A solar powered bus and trucks then brought that food back into the markets of the city. Within 10 years, Adelaide, as a major city, was able to increase its economy by 33%. It was able to create thousands of new jobs. And it also reduced its CO2 emissions by 20%. Today, it is on track to become one of the first major carbon neutral cities in the world. So here's the point. Climate action, it's just not about pulling the plug, but it's about putting the carbon back into our soils. And we understand this in Tuscany and Toscana because we have lost 80% of the carbon stock in our soils. And this is an issue no one talks about, except for Siena. According to a study by the pioneering outfit, the Rodell Institute in the United States, if we shifted toward a regenerative city approach and promoted organic farming, and we promoted a cropland vegetation worldwide on the rivers, we could actually recover 40% of our annual carbon emissions that the soil could ultimately save us as one of our great climate tools. How do we begin to go back to that process? How do we begin to look at the root of the word culture from the Latin colere, to cultivate food and nature and diversity and restoration and regeneration? How do we begin to tell a different story other than just policies and studies, but to realize that if France has announced a campaign that by the year 2030, people will be able to swim in the Seine, then why can't we do the same in Firenze, in the Arno River? What is holding us back? And I think this is where we begin to get to the concept of Botticelli's fortitude. That it's not about policies, it's about having the will and the fortitude to make these hard decisions. So I will end with this, that our ancestors here had to reinvent themselves. That's what da Vinci told us. We have to rejuvenate, regenerate. We have to Think in new ways if we're going to be able to thrive on our river, in our cities. We have to be able to turn these pressing realities and actually the mounting cost of climate change and see them as opportunities. That it's no longer how much will it cost, but in fact, how much are we losing if we don't act? Da Vinci designed his climate plan 500 years ago in 1503. And there was the Ponte Nuovo that he had in mind for the Storione, for the Kepia, for the Languilla, for the Scozzone, for the Lucio, and the Pike, and the Gobi, and the European Roach, to bring back the Arno as it was in his own time. Thank you for your time.